God's way is the best way. And that doesn't mean that it's an easy way. That doesn't mean that it's just a flower-strewn pathway. But it is truly the best way. And that's what I want to tell you and want to talk to you. There's still seats in here, folks, so I want to come in. Um, because I want to simply to tell you what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me in my life. And I want to read just a few verses from God's Word in Psalm number 40. Because in many ways, this could be the psalmist's testimony. Psalm 40, verse number 1. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God, Many shall see it and shall fear and shall trust in the Lord. Verse 17, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. And in that psalm we have the psalmist saying this, he said, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit. Notice the emphasis, he. Because you see, salvation is completely of the Lord from beginning to end. Salvation is of the Lord. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't tell us that he'll help us to save ourselves. But the Lord Jesus saves us. From our sin. Jesus saves. And then the psalmist said. Not only did the Lord. Reach down into the Mary clay. And find that's where he got him. He said. He, he didn't leave me there. He said. He brought me out of the Mary clay. Thank God that's what he did. The Lord reached down into the pit of our sin. And thank God he didn't leave us in our sin. But he brought us out of it. He brought us out of the Mary clay. And out of that horrible pit. And then he set our feet upon a rock. And let me just give you just this little outline before I give my testimony. First of all, he brought us up. And thank God that's what he did. The Lord brought us out of the Mary clay. And then it says when he brought us out of the Mary clay, that's where we were sinking down in the mire. Then he set us up. Because he set our feet upon a rock. And that's what he did because the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that rock was Christ. And so therefore we were brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And he brought us out of the miry clay. But he didn't leave us there sinking in the mire. He put our feet upon a rock. Solid ground. But then it didn't finish there. It said not only did he lift us out of that Mary clay and set our feet upon a rock, but he established our goings. In other words, he held us up. You see, not only the night I could see you, but until this very day, thank God, he's the one that holds me. It's his grace that enables me every day to serve him, to live for him, to love him. And so he not only sets our feet upon a rock, but thank God he establishes our going. He holds us up. And you know, some people said, you know, I, I would love to come to Christ, but I couldn't keep it. Listen, it's not keeping it. Thank God he keeps me. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And if there is someone here, and perhaps you know not the Lord Jesus Christ, and God knows your heart, 
And maybe there is a desire to know and want to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. But you're afraid because the devil says, you know, you could not live for the Lord. And that's true, you couldn't. Of yourself. But the grace of God is sufficient for every day. And then he does something else. He puts a new song in our mouth. Thank God he tunes us up. He gives us a new song. And I really do believe with all my heart that God's people ought to be the happiest people in all the world. Listen. My sins are forgiven. I have a friend who has promised he'll never leave me and he'll never forsake me. And I'll explain, I'll tell you what, how I've proved that in my life. <coughs> so I have one who's with me every day. Even to the very end. Because even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil there because the Lord's still with me. He's still there. And heaven too. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I have a peace which the world cannot give. Thank God I have a peace which the world can never take away. Let me tell you how it happened. I was brought up in Northern Ireland. Out in the countryside, my father was a farmer. We lived in the farm and we... I was the fifth child in the home. I had a brother, I had three sisters, but... I was the final of the children, and uh, I was the baby of the home, still am, still am the baby. But you know, whenever I was born, I always tell my brothers and sisters that when I came along, my father said to my mum, Siddy, she's called Sarah, Siddy, this is the one we're looking for all the time, but they had to have four others before they got me. It's not really true, but nevertheless. <laughs> I always like to think that somehow that I was special. And it is true, yes, I was special to my mum and to my dad. My father and mother weren't saved. They were without Christ. And then one night, my brother came home from a gospel mission. He was the eldest of the family and I was the youngest, my three sisters in between. And my brother came home and said this to my mum, Mom, I have something to tell you. I could see it tonight. Now, my mother knew about salvation because she had a godly mother. I think I told you last night that Granny was singing before she went home to heaven, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And whenever my brother said that to my mother, her natural reaction was, well, son, I'll help you the best I can. And it's amazing. Because my mother's own words were the things that convicted her heart. Because God said to her, how can you help him to be a Christian? When you're not a Christian yourself. And so the Lord started to work in my mother's heart. And we were going along to a little meeting, a little hall that was beside us, a little mission hall beside us at home. And I was sitting beside my mother, and there was a preacher there. He was from America. He was the Reverend Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill wrote a book, Why Revival Tarries, and I commend it to you. But Leonard Ravenhill was the preacher from America in that little mission hall. I was sitting beside my mother that night, not knowing what was going on in my mother's heart. But God was really speaking to my mother about salvation and her need of God's salvation and how that she would need to be a godly mother to be able to lead her children to Christ and encourage her son that had come to Christ in the ways of the Lord. And my mother was sitting there and when it came to the end of the meeting, Leonard Raven had made an appeal. And my mother, every head was bowed. And he said, if there's anyone here tonight and you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ, would you let the preacher know about it? Just as every head is bowed, would you just raise your hand? 
And my mother said this to God. She says, God, if somebody else comes, I'll come too. And immediately she made that little prayer to God, friend. Mr. Ravenhill said these words, God bless you, little girl. And there's a little girl sitting in front of my mother. And the Spirit of God said, Now there's the somebody else. Now what about you? That night my mum gave her heart and life to Christ. And she became a, a new creature. I've got a new mother. Now, we were walking down the road... And my mum said to us, the five children my mother, and my mum said, now don't you tell your daddy. Don't tell daddy. <laughs> tell your daddy what happened. And of course, we as obedient, obedient children, we were not going to tell my mother. And then something happened. We looked as we were heading down towards our home. We noticed my dad pulling out in the car, coming our direction. We were going out to visit my, my mum's people. So my dad pulled up in the car, we all jumped into the car, and uh, as we were going down the road, my father said something he never said in his life. He said, uh, well, how did the meeting go tonight? And uh, oh, he said, yes, there was a big crowd, the place was filled. Um, and he never asked these things. He says, well, did anybody get converted tonight? <laughs> <coughs> well, I looked at my brother and my sisters, and we sat there, like as we would say in Ulster, like little mice, and not opening our mouth or a squeak. And my mother, she says, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Bob, there were, there were a couple. <laughs> and he said, well, who were they? <laughs> and my mother said, Bob, there's, there's a little girl. And he told about the little girl's name. And this is true. My father said, but he said there were a couple. <laughs> Who else? And my father turns and says, Bob, And I tell you the importance of that, because you see that night, yes, God in his goodness and in his love drew my mother's confession out of her by the questions that my father asked, which he would never have asked. And she confessed Christ. Now my mum lived till she was 85 years of age. And from that night, from that night, nobody ever asked my mother was she saved? My, my mother always told them that she belonged to Jesus. And my mother started confessing Christ that night until the day the Lord called her home. She could truly really say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. My mother got saved, and then my three sisters got saved on the one night. That left my father and me. And I was troubled about this because as a little boy, I'm not a faithful Sunday school teacher. Now there were other Sunday school teachers in the church. The preacher never preached I needed to be saved. And there were other Sunday school teachers and they never told me I had to ask Jesus Christ to be my <coughs> saviour and call upon the Lord to take away my sin. But Joan was a faithful Sunday school teacher and she told us, she told us about our sin. She told us about the wages of sin. She not only told us it was a heaven, she also told us it was a hell. And those who die without Christ <coughs> don't go to heaven. They go to hell and they're there forever. She told us about the reality of death. She told us about the judgment. She told us about Jesus Christ coming again. 
And those things troubled me. And I remember lying in bed at night. My brother and I lay in the same room. And I knew my brother was saved and I wasn't. And this is how I prayed. This is what happened. I said, Lord, please don't let me die tonight. Because I'm not ready to meet you. And Lord Jesus, don't come tonight. Because I'm not ready. And then I came out, went along to a little gospel mission conducted by the late Edmund Sanford in Northern Ireland. He was a an evangelist. And at the end of that service, this little boy knelt down humbly at a form. But friend, I wasn't kneeling at a form. I was kneeling before God. And I confessed that I was a sinner and I needed Jesus Christ to save me. And I called upon the name of the Lord to save me. And praise God, he did that night. And he's my saviour. And he's my Lord. And he's my friend. That left my father. And my father loved to drink. He was a good father. But he loved alcohol. I remember running from him whenever he took the drink. And I remember one night he reached out and he says, You're my wee boy. And listen, instead of running to him, I just ran from him. I was so scared. And we prayed earnestly that God would save Daddy, <coughs> complete the family circle. Mother was saved, five children were saved, Daddy was not. Night by night we would pray that God would save him. We would kneel down at Mum and Dad's bed. We'd ask the Lord Jesus to speak to my dad and bring him to Christ. It was the last night of a gospel mission. My dad went out of that mission as usual went back to the car, we were about to get into it, and a young teenage girl stepped forward, a cousin of mine, and she said to my mother, Aunt Sidney, can I speak to Uncle Bob? She said, yes. Not knowing what she was going necessary to speak to him about, but she sat down in the seat, my mum's seat in the car, and she said, Uncle Bob, the last night of another mission, and you're still not saved. And she begged my dad to give his heart to Christ. Next thing, the door of the car opened. My father stepped out his side. Hazel stepped out her side. And the two of them walked back down to the little schoolhouse where the mission was held in, the gospel meeting was held in. And my dad gave his heart to Christ. And friend, before God, I got a new daddy that night. Because God changed him. I remember us going across in the tractors to bring in the hay in the fields where we had quite a large farm and we would gather the hay in and remember singing together, you know, a brother driving one tractor and my father driving the other and we were all out doing the work and remember us singing, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the roll is called up yonder, we'll all be there, the family. All there. And if your family's not saved, I beg you, pray for them. Pray that God will bring the last one in. The last little lamb into the, the flock. That will God bring the last one to Jesus. But you know, the story doesn't stop there because after God saved me, I had a desire to tell others. I really had a love, loving desire to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we lived out in the countryside and we had no gospel preaching church, but we went to gospel meetings. We loved to go to the little gospel evangelistic meetings all around the countryside. And then I started to try and sing and I was invited to little meetings to sing the gospel. And we went here, there, and yonder to sing about the Lord Jesus. And I got a greater desire, a greater hunger, a greater thirst to tell others. 
I, and I wanted to preach. I, I couldn't, but I, I wanted to preach. And so I remember as well, when you know, I, we lived, as I said, we lived in the farm and bringing the cows <coughs> to do the milking. And as I would send the dog into the field to get the cows and bring the, the cows out in the field, and I would stand on the side of the hedge and I would be preaching away. <laughs> telling the cow, you need to be saved. You need to be saved. And there I was standing. I wanted to preach. I wanted to tell. I remember an aunt driving along the road in the car and she says, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> because I was standing there preaching away. But there was this desire in my heart. I wanted to share it. I wanted to tell it to others. And then I had an aunt and uncle. They had no family of their own. But they looked upon, especially my sister and I, they looked upon us as their children. We loved them. But my uncle wasn't saved. He went into hospital. He got his leg amputated. I remember that hospital visit. And it was said that he was going to die. I was only a child, but I didn't want him to be lost. And I remember well going home, praying that God would step into my uncle's life. He had time for us, but he had no time for God. My mother and my aunt and another Aunt was sitting in the hospital ward. And that night, my uncle did die. And his last words were these. Oh, hell. Hell, hell. He went to eternity. I remember night after night crying myself to sleep. I think he was lost. But friend, I couldn't change it. I can't change the destiny of any man. But I said, oh God, if you allow me, if you give me the opportunity, if you give me the privilege, <coughs> I want them to warn them. I want to tell them. To flee to Christ for refuge. And so the desire, the desire was even greater to tell others about their need of Jesus. I left school and then finally got into the civil service, which is government posts as regards civil service serving for the government. But I must be honest, I wasn't satisfied. I wanted to preach. Dr. Paisley at that time in Northern Ireland was a famous preacher. I was a Presbyterian, he, Irish Presbyterian, he was a free Presbyterian. And there's a great battle going on about ecumenism and about ecumenical movement and compromise within the Presbyterian Church where they were not preaching the gospel, and my minister didn't. Never told us once we ever need to be saved. Need to be ready for heaven, never told us. And so Dr. Paisley went to prison, protesting against the compromise in the Presbyterian Church. I really had never met the man, but somehow there was an affinity in my heart because I knew he was preaching Christ. He was standing up for the Lord Jesus, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to stand up for Christ. And so I wanted to be a part of his work. And I wanted to be a free Presbyterian. Now, my father was a Presbyterian and a strong Irish Presbyterian, and the family were all was there, but I wanted, I wanted to join this movement that preached the gospel, preached Christ. 
And so I led my life, as I said earlier on, I said, Lord, I'm available. And God spoke to my heart and God called me through his precious word and gave me a desire to be in his work full time. My father said to me, son, I want you to come home and work on the farm and I'll divide the farm. I'll give half to you and half to your brother. I said, dad, I can't do it. He says, why can't you do it? I said, because I believe God's calling me into the ministry. He understood that. And so I made application to the Free Presbyterian Church. My mother and father really knew nothing about it. I went for the interview. The night that I went for the interview, God gave me a promise. Isaiah 43, fear not. I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. And I must be honest. I love the first verse that said, Listen, fear not, I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, you're mine. And I said, Lord, that's great. That's great. And you must be honest, I didn't like the second verse too well. When thou passest through the waters, through the rivers, then I didn't like the next part, through the fire. I said, Lord, this, this sounds like trouble. See, the Christian life's not an easy life. Any old dead fish can swim with the tide, it takes a lively one to swim and get it. And I was swimming against the tide, certainly of our family. But I said, Lord, I've got to go. I went to the Free Presbyterian uh, Presbytery and I applied for the ministry course and uh, I was received, accepted. And then I went home. I said, what am I going to tell my parents? Because they weren't free Presbyterians. And they were steeped Irish Presbyterians. I was, the next morning, I went out to feed the kettle. My mother came up to where I was standing. My mother said to me, William, tell me, were you accepted in the free Presbyterian church last night? And I didn't know she didn't you. I said, yes, I was. The other answer was, thank God so. That's the answer to prayer. Let me tell you this. No one ever had to tell me my mother knew Jesus Christ and loved Jesus. I'll tell you why. At night I used to climb the stairs from my mother my brother and I room, and we used to go up the stairs, up into my beside my mum and dad's room, and I used to sit down at our bedroom door, <coughs> and I heard my mother pray. She never prayed in. My mother always prayed out, and I used to sit at her bedroom, and I heard her in touch with God, friend. And let me tell you. She loved Jesus with all her heart. And when she was 85 years of age, and she was lying in a hospital bed, and I went to visit her one night before she came home, and this young, this young male nurse, Roman Catholic lad, he called me to the side and he said to me, Mr. McRae, your mother really loves Jesus, doesn't she? I said, yes, she does. He says, you know, I heard her pray. In the open ward, she said, Lord Jesus, I love my family with all my heart. And she left each one of us with the Lord, and then she said, but Lord Jesus, I love you best of all.
tell me, do you love the Lord Jesus? My Jesus, I love you. I know you're mine. God called me into his work and I went into the ministry. And I became assistant to Dr. Paisley. And then I had a burden for my locality, the neighborhood where I was, about 15 miles from where I was, I was asked to conduct a gospel mission. I started a tent mission. Now let me tell you, it wasn't a fancy tent, it was an army reject tent. And you know it was bad whenever the army rejected. <laughs> and I'll tell you how bad it was, and this is true, whenever it was really raining, really hard raining, we had to put umbrellas inside the tent. <laughs> because there were holes all over the, all over it, wee holes all over the tent, and the rain started to come in. But let me tell you, the blessing of God came down. And precious souls were gloriously saved. That was in Macrofell. And I started that mission in 1968. July 68. God called me back to that work because when I say God called me back to it, I was still studying in the college. I held another mission in Scarva. Then I went back to Desert Martin and then I collapsed. Burnout. Went to hospital, was there, and had to take off. Uh, Presbytery put me off for six months. And then went down to Kilkeel, which our brother would know very, very well, to recuperate. And after that six months, I came back and started my ministry in Macrofelt. That was in June 1969, and I've been there 46 years on ever since. Now, I've got to realize the time is quickly going, but I say life's not easy because taking a stand in our province was very dangerous. We got, Anne and I got married in June, 25th of June, 1971. And just before we were married, there was a protest or for, a, for a service and uh, an open air gospel service that they Orange Institution was holding in our, not far away from us, and they banned it. You were not allowed to hold the service, but we decided we had to take a stand because this was a gospel service, and we had to take a stand, and for that, I got six months imprisonment. As I said, we got married in June, July was the court case. In between those two, I went into hospital to get my appendix out. And then the wound turned and subterrated, and then I had to put a tube out to the side. I was still in the hospital whenever the court case day came. So I had to leave the hospital bed and go to the court. Remember sitting in the dock, <coughs> judge sitting there, and at the end of the story, he said this. I sentence you to six months imprisonment in Her Majesty's prison, Crumlin Road, Belfast. And to be honest, I didn't feel like laughing. Because that was completely new to our family. Was I shaming them? But I had to be willing to suffer reproach for Jesus Christ. All of a sudden, I hear this thud in the courtroom, and there was my wife lying on her mouth and nose on the ground. She fainted. She had plenty of time to come round. Six months. <laughs> I had six months in prison. Well, I didn't do six, I did four months in prison. But God gave me the opportunity, even in prison, to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, through that witness in prison, the young man that was with me in prison in the cell was brought to Christ, gloriously saved. God can bring you through difficulties, difficult circumstances. One other thing I would say this, I remember I was ill for a period of time 
And when I went into hospital, they told me it was, it was just my fifth child, our, our last child was born. And I went, my wife came home on the Saturday with the child and I went into hospital on the Monday and was there for six weeks. They told me that I would be best make my will because they thought I was having cancer. But I'm here. God brought me through. I became a member of Parliament. The need, the need was in our area for people to stand up and be counted, take a stand for the gospel's sake. And I became a member of the local assembly. I was a local councillor for 37 and a half years. I was five times the, the mayor, the chairman of the, the, the council, the local council. And then I was asked to stand for the local assembly and I was elected there. And then in 1983, I was asked to stand for Parliament. And God was giving me opportunities with Dr. Paisley, who was a member of Parliament. I, God was giving us opportunities to take our stand in the United Kingdom Parliament for the Lord Jesus. And I was willing to do that. But there's always a cost, because you see, there was a terrorist campaign in Northern Ireland at that time. I got a bomb for my... 40th birthday. In Northern Ireland they say, life begins at 40. <laughs> well, mine was 10. It was a real bomb. It wasn't, let me tell you, it wasn't a fool thing. It wasn't a fake thing. It was a real bomb. But God was good. God preserved my life. And then, later on, they riddled my home with 50 bullets. The IRA. But once again, God preserved us. I was called in on a Friday. I remember the police officers calling me in and saying, Mr. McRae, there's something to tell you. I said, what is it? They said, you're to be murdered this weekend. And I said, me? He said, Mr. McRae, don't laugh. This is serious. It was a nervous laugh, to be honest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I said, this can't be happening, this can't be happening to me, but it was. For 25 years, I sailed in the back of a police car. Everywhere I went, every meeting I took, every visit I made, whether it was to the hospital, whether it was to somebody sick home or sick bed. I was in an armoured police car, bulletproof <coughs> windows. If you go to our home today, every window's armoured plate. Every one of the bulletproof windows. But we have moved on. And I've still survived. I wish I could tell you everything that the Lord has done for me because I can say with a psalm that I read this morning, the Lord hath done great things for me, whereof I'm glad. I want you young people to present yourself to God and say this to the Lord, 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 I'm available, whatever you want. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. But friend, let me tell you, if you don't mean it, don't say it. So a man stood in Belfast one day and he had these, what we call sandwich, uh, he had a tax description at the front and a tax description at the back and he was walking about <coughs> Belfast Street. And he says, Lord, I'll go anywhere. This is true. He says, Lord, I'll go anywhere but China. <laughs> now, this is true. You know what the Lord said to him? That's interesting. Because that's exactly where I want you to go. And the Lord took him to China. You see, when you vow, you've got to pay. Go through with God 
thy vows to bear thy life upon the altar lay. The Holy Ghost will do the rest. He'll give to you God's very best.